if you guys have your Bibles, open them up with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame. You know, um, in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call that the love chapter. And this is called the faith chapter. So it, it really is like the high holy hill of, of faith. We're going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews chapter 11, so I don't want to hear no jokes. I'm going to make it fun of me because we didn't get through it. I'm not planning on getting through it very fast at all, right? If we get three verses today, I'm going to be happy, so put your seatbelt on and relax. We're going to spend some time camping in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Today is kind of a setup to faith, and really the topic of faith is one of the central themes of the entire Bible, right? Trust and faith kind of go together, but as, as Christ followers, it's about our faith. And so, you know, you think of faith, hope, and love, the big three, right? And, and right in Hebrews chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, you get two of the three major points that are, that are, that are the themes of our entire Bible's faith and hope. So um, we're going to tackle that today. And so because it's introductory and there's a lot of kind of outlining stuff we're going to cover today, I'd like to just read um, Hebrews chapter 11, maybe the first 12 verses to get us a running start for today. So let's read it together. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders, that's you folks, obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the words, the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Somebody say amen. But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he co condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in, in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And all of these died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the, that country from which they had come out of the world, they had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. Any idea what that city is called? New Jerusalem. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who had received the promise, offered, up, offered his only begotten son of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received in him a in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and his gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. 
esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured and seeing him who was vis- invisible. By faith he kept the promise, and of the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas Egyptians attempted to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mocking and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise of God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So in, in Hebrews chapter 11, we get two things. We get a description of faith, and we also get a demonstration of faith. Now, understanding faith, it's, it's kind of a multifaceted word. It's, it's not just very, it's not real simple, right? Um, one of the things we see in Ephesians 2.8, somebody quote Ephesians 2.8 for me. Oh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, lest any man boast. It's a gift of God. Um, so, there, so this is the first type. There's three types of faith that we'll kind of focus on. And again, I, I don't want to narrow any of this into any kind of like absolute, right? It's, it's such a big topic. But we'll look at just the three um, simple aspects of faith. And so the first is Ephesians 2.8, saving faith. When you, when you asked Jesus in your heart, when you surrendered your life to him, you were saved, you were born again. That part of faith can be um, um, simple in the fact that the Bible doesn't complicate salvation. Again, I give the analogy sometimes that if, if you're on a plane and the plane is, is going down and the pilot has come over the loudspeaker and he said, double engine failure, we're going down, you know, whatever you got to do till we hit the ground, but it's, it's a done deal. If you're on that plane and you're with all kinds of different ministers from the Jehovah Witnesses and LDS and all these different people, Muslims and and Buddhists and Hare Krishna and, and everybody, and you have the, that much time to figure it out, you better hope I'm on the plane with you. Because I'll keep it really simple. Trust and believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Trust and believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Now, I, everybody else and every other kind of system, there's other things, right? There's other ideas. Do all that you can do, um, you know, and, and, and all these things and these rituals and rites and things that you have to do. But the Bible, in the area of saving faith, it starts very simple. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 10 and in, in Acts chapter 16, trust and believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Now, understand that word believe has um, a surrender to it. You know, the Bible says the demons believe and tremble, but they're not saved. They're not going to heaven. Satan knows and and he believes and he sees, but it doesn't mean he's going to heaven. So the word believe does have to be defined, right? There's action to believe. There's action to the faith that we put in Jesus. Believe means that if I said there's a bomb under your chair, and, and, and yeah, ha, 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 and you sit down, you relax, you listen to the rest of the message, well, you, you don't really believe because believe is what? Get up and run out of the building as fast as you can. That's believe. There's action behind it. There's surrender. And, and, and to trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And once you put your faith in Jesus, you're born again. You repent one time unto salvation. You'll repent the rest of your life unto sanctification. And sanctification is the process from the time that you became a believer, that you put your trust in Jesus, and you became born again until the time that you die. And in that process, it's called sanctification of becoming more like Jesus every day. 
every day more like Jesus, every day as we grow in Him, as we grow in Him. So that's saving faith. And then the second aspect of faith is um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we should, we should turn there, it says that there's a gift of faith. And this is listed among um, eight other spiritual gifts that God gives to individuals. Now, um, so, some of these gifts, for example, one of the gifts is a gift of healing. But you know what? There's nobody on planet Earth that, that, that is, uh, has a gift of healing in a way that that's something that they just can do all the time. If that was the case, then we would just send these folks through the hospital and they would just go and clear out all the hospitals and those things. But some people that have been given the gift of healing, they'll pray and, 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 and people will get healed. But it, it, God chooses the timing and the, and the situation and uses those. The gift of faith can be that way where it's not like if I have a gift of faith that just 100% of the time, you know, it's in effect and I, I live all by faith. Um, we're going to study about Abraham, and Abraham really for, for you know, 50% of, of, of religions, Abraham is the father of faith. He's the father of faith to Judaism, to, to Islam, and to Christianity. And, and, he, and his life testimony is that he demonstrated the, the great faith. He's, he's called the father of faith, Father Abraham had many sons. Well, he's the father. He's the father of faith. He's the example of faith. But yet Abraham in his life had a couple failures. And you know what area of life that Abraham failed in? Faith. He, he lacked faith in situations. And, he, and he's the father of faith. So this gift of faith that's listed in 1 Corinthians 12, let me read it to you. It says um, in verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 12, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the manifestation of the Spirit is the gifts of the Spirit that God imparts um, to different people for um, different purposes and different functions. But let me tell you something. It's kind of side note, rabbit trail for a minute. The gifts of the Spirit that God gives are for you to use to help other people. Only one gift of the Spirit is, is for self-edification. 100% of them are to equip and to um, serve the body of Christ. So God in this room, again, He's given different gifts. And as each one of us come together, we talk about this concept all the time. As the church, then you have the gift of encouragement. Melissa and Gary have a gift of hospitality. So they've opened up their home to strangers and to everybody. That's a gift. And, and we share the gifts that we have. And together, those gifts are needed and we're different parts of the body. And so, um, and then it goes on and it says in verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. And so here we have um, this second aspect of faith, which is the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I've had, and it's my favorite, and I, again, I don't want to say like, you know, I, I do believe I've had and have the gift of faith. You know, my, I, you know, all the time I tell my wife, oh, you just got to have faith. You got to have faith. And, you know, I'm talking about finances. And she, she's like, oh, what are you talking about? I said, I have faith. She's like, no, you don't have faith. You just don't do math. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't do math either. I just, I, I just believe, you know. And, and, and there's been some cool times. And, and really it's exciting, like, when, when God gives you an opportunity and, and he gives you the faith. You know, and that's a gift because it's, it's something that God has given and, and I've experienced at times. I remember when we first started this church, this, this was the four suites here um, in this building that were rented. This was a dance studio. This was a barber. That was um, Sweet Pea, the five and dime that was there, and then the medical supply place that was here. And we rented this building first, and um, it was really a stretch. We, we, it was $2,400 down, $1,200 a month. They wanted first and last when we, when we rented the building. And so the church at the time, we were just a Bible study in my house on Wednesday nights, and we had started receiving a tithe about halfway through that, and we told the folks that the money is so we could start a Sunday morning and rent a building, and I find this place. And so the guy wanted first and last months. Well, the church account at the time had $2,200 in it. So that I needed 24. So Lydia and I wrote a check just so the church didn't go in the red for $400, and we put it in there on loan. And and so I wrote the first check the church ever wrote was for $2,400. And technically, at the time, we were negative $200. We didn't have a chair, we didn't have a pulpit, we didn't have a TV, we didn't have a screen. We had you know nothing, and we had one month to get ready for our first launch, which was going to be September 1st. 
And about halfway through September, um, I was driving and, and God gave me a gift of faith. And he told me, I want you to rent the second side. And I was so, so excited. We had negative $200, but I knew, and, and I had such a gift. It wasn't, there was no doubting. There was just excited. The first thing I did was I, 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 as I always do, you know, I called my pastor and, and I was so excited to tell him. I said, God has spoken to me clearly. He's given me faith. I know this is going to happen. He told me to rent the second side. So I, I call the guy from, and, he, and, he, and he's in Sugar House, his office is Sugar House. He's got to drive out here to Twilla. I'm totally wasting his time. I got negative $200. And I'm like, I'm a big player now. You know, like I, I'm renting two suites. He's going to have to work with me. And, you know, and the guy's coming out and we make the arrangements for this meeting on Monday. And I came to the church, you know, and I said, hey, God has really spoken to me that we're supposed to rent this other side. And, you know, you, you get that voice sometimes. And I remember a certain people like, oh, you know, and they're negative and they're, you know, and I was, I was asking this, I was like, will you guys pray over this thing? And I really feel like we're going to need this space. And um, I had already decided what I was doing. I didn't care what they told me. <laughs> Honestly, I just knew God had given me a gift of faith and, 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 and it was, it was sure. And so I call the guy and he's going to come out on Monday and it's, it's, it's now Saturday and I, we haven't got any more money. I still negative $200 and I'm going to, you know, waste this guy's time and he's going to come out and I get this weird call on a Saturday night. And it's like, this guy's like, hey, I want to meet with you tomorrow, and I can't tell you why, but show up and you'll find out. And so I, you know, I, 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 I agreed to meet with him, and he, he wanted to go to, out to eat, so we went to this little restaurant here on the corner, uh, Dimitri's. And so that day, Lydia's like, are you going to meet with him? I was like, yeah, I gave him my word. I told him I was going to meet with him. So I, like, kissed my wife and my kids goodbye, and I was like, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to go meet with this guy. And so, so he, he, you know, he takes me out to, to lunch on a Sunday. And he, you know, he says, hey, you don't know me. And, um, but God has, God has spoken to me that I'm supposed to help you guys out. And um, he said, you know, I don't want to be known. I don't want anybody to know. And he said, I, I haven't been disobedient, but God told me over a month ago to do this. And he said, I, I've been really seeking the Lord to make sure that's God's will because it's, it's kind of crazy, but I know God has told me to help you guys out. And so he hands me an envelope and he says, don't open that till you get home and don't ever tell anybody where you got it. And so I said, all right. So, you know, we talked, he asked me a bunch of questions about tithing, what the church believes in giving and all these things. And we spent an hour together. Amazing guy. I'm not, not a, not an uber wealthy guy. He was just, just an average guy. He was a retired cop who worked his whole life. And he got into a ministry, um, just organically. He, he emptied his savings account. They went to Texas and in Texas they were doing some American missions and after a disaster there and, and God had asked him to make a radical faith. And again, retired cop, not a, not, a, not a wealthy guy by any means. And he had about, I don't know what it was at the time, some money in his savings account. And God told him to completely empty his savings account and give it to a particular um, um, need in Texas. And he did it. And then about um, four days later, God doubled the money that he gave and put it back in his account through some supernatural miracle. And so he started doing that. And every time he did it, God, God would, would do it. So anyways, we were done. And so he told me I had to go home before I go open the check. I wasn't going to make it home. This side was already done and or was open. And so I came to the church and I was standing right where Matt's cowboy hat is. And I, I opened the check. I opened the envelope and there was a check for $40,000 in it. And it was you know, to this day, how we got started, you know, it was like, and it was, it was such a, such a gift and a miracle. And the next day on Monday, now I'm like, ah, I got some money now, you know, but, but God had given me the, a, a gift of faith in that moment for that moment, for that situation. And I mean, I was spending money I didn't have. I was making appointments. I had already stepped out because God had given me the gift of faith. And, you know, and, and that's part of the, the testimony that we're going to see through Hebrews 11, where supernaturally God gives at times when we needed a gift of faith. You know, the Apostle Paul says, um, you know, the one thing I do is I forget those things that are behind and I press toward. You know, I talk about the way I, I, I talk about that as I, you've heard me say, drive the car of life through the windshield, right? And don't look in the rearview mirrors. And, and God wants you to move forward. God, your lawless deeds and your sins, God said, I will remember no more. And if we get stuck on, on regret and depression and things because of past failures, God can't, can't help us and God can't make us move forward. So God says we have, to, we have to forget those things that are behind and move forward. And, and, and you can't change yesterday. You can change tomorrow. And that's God's direction and will for your life is to, is to forget what's behind and move forward. 
And, and in that sentiment, as Paul is sharing that, you know, he's saying that God does absolutely everything. I, I can't take, Paul says, I can't take, and Paul, of course, is no human in flesh ever been used more than the Apostle Paul to further the gospel here on earth. Of course, Jesus, but, you know, um, and, and so Paul is talking about this, and he's saying, all these things I've done, God gets credit for everything, I can't do anything. And then we say, well, well, maybe there's one thing. I put my faith in God to believe in him and trust in him. Do I get credit for that? Like, God does everything, but I put my faith in him. The Bible says, God gave you that faith. You don't even get credit for that. And so Paul says, there's only one thing I can do. There's only one thing I can, I can do as I press forward, I move on. And then the last part of the three, so again, the three types of faith, saving faith, Ephesians 2.8, the gift of faith, 1 Corinthians 12. And then um, here the one that's in, fo- in focus is um, in Hebrews 11, that's really kind of the idea, is the inspiration to live by faith, live by faith. And so um, we're going to be inspired, and, and, and again, it's going to describe faith. And and then it's going to demonstrate faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about some other things. And again, um, somebody do this real quick for fun. Who who uses Blue Letter really well? Anybody know Blue Letter? Go to the search on Blue Letter, whole Bible, and type the word in faith. And and it'll tell you how many times the word is used in the Bible. I want to know that number. I should have done it this morning, but I didn't do it. So anyways, there's so much. And, and I'm sure you guys have favorite verses and ideas, so don't, don't, don't judge me if I missed your favorite verse on faith. I'm going to pick just a couple, and there's so many, but let's look at some of what the Bible has to say about the word faith and the idea of how we, we, we live by faith. So the first one is um, only two times in the Bible does it say that Jesus marveled. The word marveled is um, used by other people, and, and you see where people marvel and, and these kind of things, but only twice is it where um, Jesus marvels. And in both times, it has to do with faith. The word marvel is to stand amazed at. And so for Jesus to be observe a situation and to be amazed at this situation, only recorded twice, once in Mark's Gospel in chapter 6, verse 7, and Jesus is in Nazareth. And there's, he can't do miracles, and there's great unbelief in Nazareth. And it says that Jesus marveled at their unbelief of the, of the Jews in Nazareth that, that wouldn't believe. And then the other occasion is in Luke 7, 9, and Jesus marvels this time at, at a Gentile's great faith. And so the, the, the centurion, how many times? Is that the whole Bible or just the New Testament? Okay, 229 times. So, so I'm going to pick a couple. Oh, you and Gary got to have it out. You guys might want to go outside and <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> so anyways, and then needless to say, the importance of faith in our life as Christ followers. Now, what is faith? Now, now, a couple uh, quotes here. This is from my pastor. My pastor says, faith, you ready? You can tweet this out, write this down. Faith is the confident obedience to the Word of God. Faith is confident obedience to the Word of God. Let me read again. Oh, actually, we'll get to it in a second. And then this is a quote I heard about faith that I loved. And another said, a little, or little faith will bring your soul to heaven, and great faith will bring heaven to your soul. In verse 1, let's read, let's look at verse 1 of Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the substance, everybody say substance, of things hoped for, the evidence, everybody say evidence, of things seen. That's what I said. (laughs) For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. So faith, hope, and love, again, the big three kind of theme of our Bible. And in verse 1, we get both two, uh, faith and hope. Now, listen, it's super important to me that we understand something about faith as Christians. Super important. Listen, if you get anything today, get this. The faith that we have as believers, it's not blind faith. You know, that's sometimes the idea about faith, that faith is like this ethereal thing that God expects you just to, you know, without evidence and without substance, just to have this blind faith. That that is not a Christian concept by any stretch of the means. 
It says here in, in Hebrews that your faith is your evidence. Your faith is the substance. You know, again, I told that hallelujah story this morning. You know, that was a little nugget of faith where God showed up in my life. And again, just something off out of the ordinary a little bit. The Holy Spirit touched me in a time of prayer and, and the Holy Spirit was on me. But that's a nugget. That's a substance. That, that's evidence in my heart. Now, it's not necessarily evidence that I can go on CNN tonight and prove there's a God. But I, but I can prove in my own heart, in my own life, there's things you'll never take from me. God spoke to me very clearly when I was a young believer in these just simple words that I was going to heaven. He gave me and spoke to me by the Holy Spirit and assurance of salvation. And some say, oh, well, that's, that's, you know, I've talked to a guy and he's, you know, an atheist and me and this guy would debate, debate. I was working at Walmart and we'd spend hours, supposed to be working, but we'd kind of work, but we would, <laughs> I mean, laborious. And, and I remember t- sharing with him that I was going to heaven and he thought that was so arrogant of me to believe that I was going to heaven. And that's not arrogant at all. Every one of us should have an assurance of salvation. It's given to you in the word of God. Now, the Holy Spirit, in my case, he, he confirmed and he spoke that to me very clearly. And it's something that, that, that motivated me. And still to this day, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. And the Bible says in 1 John that you can know that you know that you know that you're saved. So there's no, it's not, it's not a blind faith. It's not a, a blind substance. Here's a challenge for you. Not, never one time in the entire Bible does God call someone to step out in faith where they didn't first know, know the will of God? Okay? So, so faith, blind faith is not, oh, I just, you know, I don't know, you know, and I'm just kind of willy-nilly going for it in faith. That's not what faith is. Every time God calls people to great steps and, and great uh, opportunities to step out in faith, but every time, not one time, do they not first already know what the will of God is. It still requires faith. Let me give you an example, one of my favorite examples of the Bible. Turn with me, if you will, really quick, to um, 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we get this amazing story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Now, Jonathan was the son of Saul. Him and David were best friends. And um, they're, they're, they're at war. And in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel, we have this example of great faith. Everybody say great faith. Now, it happened on that day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now, jump down to verse number 5, and it says, The front of one face northward, opposite of Michmash, the other southward towards Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be, everybody say, it may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or few. So the two armies, the Philistines and the Israelites are encamped. And Jonathan is looking over the entire army of the Philistines. And he says to his armor bearer, hey, let's go fight that entire army just by ourselves. Maybe God can, God, God is good. God can deliver. You know, if you play the lottery, you don't got to buy a hundred tickets. If God wants you to win, he can do it with one. You're not going to win the lottery anyway, so save your money. Go get a Big Mac. <laughs> and if you win the lottery, it probably won't be good for you anyways. I read this thing again here, a little rabbit trail. I read this thing a couple weeks ago, and it was, it was, it was kind of encouraging. But um, they talked about people who had survived cancer and people who had won the lottery. And the people who had won the lottery, five years later, their lives were destroyed. And the people who had survived cancer, five years later, their lives were, were great. And the hardship they went through, and God carried them through and endured. And so, you know, in these cases, the cancer was better than winning the lottery. All right, that has nothing to do with Jonathan and, and, and his armor bearer. But again, put yourselves in, in, in his shoes, in this situation. Don't let this be like a Mickey Mouse story that, you know, let this be a real event. And, and try, to, uh, try to feel it that way. Try to hear it that way. Jonathan is there. These are real soldiers, real, real men, real weapons. And Jonathan gets this crazy idea. Let's go fight the whole army. Come on, somebody. Like, that's great faith. Or stupid. One of the two. Absolutely. This guy's either off his rocker or, or just has amazing great faith because, again, he's going to die. But listen, that's the story. So he has the idea. First of all, it's just his idea. And then, and then look, what his, um, look, look what his armor bearer says in verse number 7. So his armor bearer said to him, Oh, do all that is in your heart. Listen, 
When you want to step out in faith, that's the guy you want standing next to you. Hey, I want to rent this second building and I got minus $200. Oh, Pastor Chris, go for it. That's the voice I wanted to hear. And not somebody saying, well, I don't know. We're going to need this space, a lot of money. No, I want, I want the person standing next to me says, oh, oh, do all that's in your heart. Not only do I want that voice standing next to me, as um, that person, Jonathan, that's the voice I want to listen to. And if there's 10 voices and one of them says, oh, do all that's in your heart, and, and the other are doing math, then, you know, I don't want to hear those voices. And I want to be that voice for somebody else. I had a situation here one time, and, you know, I'm thinking of this situation. Jonathan is armor bearer, and his armor bearer is, is encouraging Jonathan and taking a radical... And listen, the armor bearer is given his own life. Like, he understands when Jonathan says, hey, let's you and me go fight the entire army, that, that, that Jonathan's not the only one that's going to die in this great step of faith. So he's even willing to put his life on it. And he says, oh, go do all that's in your heart. And listen, as a pastor, like, I want to be that guy. If you guys come to me with faith, I had this time one time, and, and someone came to me, and they opened their wallet, and they handed me their paycheck for the, for the week paycheck. And, and they turned it over, and they signed it over to the church. And they just said, God told me to give this. And I took the check, and I said, are you sure? And he looked at me like, and I was like, what am I doing? Like, that, that's his step of faith, and it's crazy. And I'm worried for him, and now I feel responsible that he's given me <laughs> all of his money. But at the same time, I realized what I should have told him was, do all that's in your heart and, and support his step of faith, you know? And we laughed about it later, and, it, you know, it was good. But at the same time, it was like my original response was, oh, man, like, that's a radical step of faith. Are you sure? You know, and, and, and listen, I just, want to, I just want to say, hey, do all that's in your heart, man. If God's called you to some radical step of faith and you know the will of God, now look at the rest of the story. And then it says, um, so his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. And Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will, we will show ourselves to them. Look at verse number nine. If they, everybody say if they. Listen, this is the first step. And Jonathan wants to take a radical step of faith, but you know what he's going to do first? He's going to discern the will of God. He's going to discern whether God is in this or not. Because when God calls you to step out in faith, you don't do it before you know the will of God. You hear that? Okay? We know the will of God. It's not blind faith. And so he says, okay, he's got this idea, but first, let's make sure God's in it. We don't, you know, we don't want to get out in front of the Lord. And sometimes you, you can fall in a step of faith. If, if you take a step of faith and it's in the flesh, because it feels good and you want to do something and, and yet God's not in it and it falls down. That's not God's fault. God didn't fail you. But, but discern and know the will of God. You know, I, I think it was a step of faith when Lydia and I left California. Things were comfortable in California. Life was good in California when we left. And, and it was like, it was a step of faith. It was exciting. I was so excited to do it. I was willing to go to Williston, North Dakota, just because I wanted, you know, to do something and, and for God to use me. But there, were, there was a, a long process of discerning and making sure we knew the will of God. So, so he says, if they say thus to us, wait until we come up, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. And so he's going to discern. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. In verse 10, it says, if they, everybody say, if they. And then they'll know the will of the Lord. These are the things that Jonathan did to discern the will of the Lord. Okay, okay. now they, they got the sign. And I'll go on in the story. Jonathan gave these two ideas. If God's in it, then they'll tell us to come down to them. If God's not in it, they'll say we're coming up to you. So Jonathan makes the, the plea and they say come down here. And now Jonathan knows God is in it. Now at this point, Jonathan knows the will of God. Now let me ask you this question. Is it now just easy for Jonathan as armor bearer? It's still scary. They're still going to go down and, and, and put their life in harm's way and put their life. And so listen, when God calls you to step out in faith and you know the will of God, it doesn't take away from the, the majesty, the power, the excitement of living by faith and stepping out in faith because it still requires faith. It's still scary. You know, it was still scary to make that decision and, and, and end up looking like a fool and, and it's still required to, to step out. But if God's called you to step out, step out. And so we have this radical um, step of faith there. I had something kind of cool happen this week. 
Do you guys remember Cliff and Megan Jennings? Some of you will. They moved to Sheridan, Wyoming. They, um, they got saved in our church. Well, they, they were kind of, they got saved in our church. We baptized them. They were growing in the Lord. And, and they moved to Sheridan, Wyoming. And Cliff called me um, last week, and, and he was talking about the, they haven't really found a church. They've been involved in a church, and they kind of feel like God is calling them on. And, and there's no Calvary Chapel in Sheridan. And um, so Cliff was, was just talking to me. He was asking for some advice. And he was asking about his church and how to handle this situation. And I told him, as I always do, Cliff, you have to hear the voice of God. I prayed for him. I encouraged him, you know, talk to him. But I said, until you and Megan both know and hear the voice of God, that's, that's the voice. And I don't want to tell him, stay, leave, do this, because I don't want my voice to weigh in. I gave him the best counsel I could and talked through the situation. He told me what was going on that was, that was really kind of bugging him. And so he called me back about a week later and he said, we've been praying and, and we feel like, you know, that it's time for us to move on. And, and so I said, all right. So I said, well, let's, I said, I'll do this. I said, I'll call, I'll call Pastor Gerald and, you know, CBI is graduating 50 young people every year. And one of the things we're doing is planting churches and looking for a church. So I called dad and I said, hey, dad, I got a friend named Cliff and he's in Sheridan, Wyoming, and there's no Calvary Chapel. There used to be a little tiny Calvary Chapel there and the pastor's in his 70s and they're not really meeting and, and nothing going on. They have like a Zoom call they're doing. And so I said, do you have anybody that um, might want to plant a church in Sheridan, Wyoming? Or, you know, can you put it on the radar at least and put it out there? And that was on a Friday afternoon. And then Saturday about 10 a.m., Pastor, that was Friday night, 5 o'clock, next morning, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., my phone rings, it's Pastor Gerald, and he's all excited. He's like, you'll never believe what happened. I was like, no, I probably will. Throw it on me. <laughs> he said this, this kid named Zach who graduated with Keaton, his good friends with Keaton, he said he was one of our, one of our best and brightest young men. He, um, he's he's kind of he's country, and, but the guy was super sharp, man. He loved Jesus. He could teach. He was just really, really, really a, a shining star in that, that graduating class. Somebody, you know, was really well. He said, he called me this morning, and he said, Pastor Gerald, I was in prayer this morning, and he hadn't talked to him in over a year, and he said, for some reason, God told me to call you this morning. And Gerald said, really? He's like, I just got to, he's like, you want to go to Sheridan, Wyoming and plant a Calvary Chapel? And so, you know, so Zach is praying about it. He's 22 years old. And um, how old is that? Is that right? Okay. <laughs> it looks like he's 45. Well, that'll help. That'll help. Share it in Wyoming. So anyways, I want to ask you guys with that story. So anyway, it was cool. So, I, so, I, so Gerald gave me Zach's number. I called Zach, started talking with Zach. And I said, listen, Zach, we, we, the process we need to start right now is if they, right? And, and that's the discerning the will of God. I said, so we don't want to manufacture this. I said, it's really cool how it happened. Like, you know, of all things, you haven't talked to Gerald in a year. God told you to call him five minutes after I called him and asked him for looking for someone to plant a church and share it in Wyoming. And I said, so let's start praying. Let's, let's start seeking the Lord. I want you to start praying. And so he agreed to start praying for the people in Sheridan that need a church and, and for his will. And this was a couple weeks ago. He, Zach called me yesterday to update and he said, I haven't got any confirmation yet and I'm still praying, but I am praying for the people. And um, I'm supposed to meet with my pastor team this week and I'll know a little more then and I said okay well you know again when God speaks to you if you feel like this is a door that, that God is encouraging you in I said we'll plan a trip we'll go up we'll spend a couple days we'll scout out the land we'll meet some people and and see what happens but that's then that's how I got here it was kind of the same idea you know we'll scout out the land we came up and then eventually it happened so pray for that pray for Sheridan Wyoming and um, Jonathan all right guys I'm almost out of time but we're gonna we're gonna cover a little bit more so can you guys give me like bear with me can we go over a few minutes today yeah, thank you. Okay, so a couple things about faith. All right, so the thing I said, the one thing I want you to remember, right? So I'm going to go back backwards before I move forward. We're already late, but listen, it's super important you understand. Faith is not blind, and God does not call you to step out in faith that you don't first know His will. And so the process is discerning the will of God in our lives. All right, we got that. Now, let me just go through a couple of New Testament scriptures that encourage us in walking and living by faith and what the Bible says. The first one is in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 7, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So in verse 14 of chapter 10, it says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? 
So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so, again, part of your daily discipline of reading the Word of God every day is to encourage your faith, is to build up your faith. It's full of faith stories. It's full of other people's faith stories. When you hear my faith stories, when you see the stories, and that's what Hebrews 11 is. You remember all the names that I read through all the history of the Old Testament and all these things where these people stepped out in faith and God showed up and did miracles and God showed up and took care of them and blessed them. And so we read these things and we put these things in our heart. And then when it becomes our turn, to have to live by faith. You know, may, maybe it's cancer, the dreaded C word. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's something. You know, you, you're going to require a big step of faith and, 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 and stepping out and living in faith through that situation. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Very important that we front load, that, that we, we put these things in our heart, right? That we're prayed up, that we're prepared. If you get that dreaded phone call one day, you don't have time to pause that situation and say, wait, 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 hold on. I want to pretend like I didn't hear that. I need to pray. I need to get encouraged and need to be, you know, and, and go spend some time with the Lord so that I'm ready for that phone call. It already came, right? So we're, we're, we're front loaded. We're pre, you know, we call it prayed up. We're kind of, I don't know, I don't want to like that term, but that's the idea, right? Is that you're pre prepared and putting the Word of God in our lives. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, another idea of faith. It says that we, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, I'm sorry, yes, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by, not by sight. And then in Hebrews and in Romans also, it says the just shall live by faith. So we walk by faith, we live by faith, not by sight. You guys have a favorite faith verse? Yeah, that one's right here. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. All right, I think we're out of time. <clears throat> um, yeah. If I start this next kind of piece, we're going we're gonna to be... Hey, so read ahead. I told you guys today was introduction. Um, next week, we'll get into some of the characters. Some of the stories that, that are going to come out of these characters are, are super powerful. So read ahead. We're going to do um, Enoch next week and Abraham are the two big ones. We'll see Cain and Abel in a couple of... We're going to cover Enoch um, in, in one of my favorite stories. And if I get into Enoch right now, we're going we're gonna to be in bad shape. So Keaton's coming up. Let's have the worship team come up. And let's let's stand together. All right, we did it. So here's my encouragement for you all today. Let's live by faith. Let's walk by faith. Hey, we don't have faith in faith. Okay? Don't, don't get it twisted. That, that's, that's a different church. It's a different concept. You know? Oh, he just had enough faith. He just got to have faith. I heard a sermon one time. Let me tell you. I think it was Creflo Dollar, one of those guys. And it was this whole crescendo. Listen to this. One of these, this is the faith in faith churches. The, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. God's intention for your life is to be happy, healthy, wealthy all the time. The prosperity gospel nonsense. And, and this guy had the audacity. The, the nerve, I couldn't believe it. It's like the Bible says if you take away from the Bible or if you add to the Bible, God will take away from your life and he will add to your life the plagues of this Bible. And this, this is, and there's some bad doctrine, but this one was seriously messing with the Word of God. And it took him 45 minutes to go through it, and he's talking about faith, and he's teaching about faith, and he's talking about the verse in, in, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, um, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And he, and he goes to this big crescendo, and he says, you see, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is faith. And I'm like, and he had this whole explanation to explain how it's faith, but I'm like, Man, that's faith in faith. Listen, we don't put faith in faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And, and God's going to show up. And I'll tell you what, you know, that, that, that story of, you know, renting the second building and stepping out in faith, those, those are the most exciting times of walking with Christ is just to take big faith. 
And again, very clearly, I'm not talking about just radically doing something in the flesh. I'm talking about seeking the Lord, knowing God's will for a situation, and then when you know the will, at that point, exercise your faith and don't be afraid to step out and watch God show up and do something amazing in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for faith. We thank you that our faith is in Jesus, that our faith is real, it's substance, it's evidence, it's not blind. We know that we know that we know that we're saved. And we have, Lord, and the only, only people on the planet, Lord, is evangelical Christians who know Jesus that can have a true assurance of faith. Because every other system is religion. And every other system has something that we have to add to it. And Lord, there's nothing that we can add or take away from the, from the saving grace of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so, Father, give us opportunities to live by faith. God, help us to walk by faith. And Lord, help us to share our faith. And Father, we pray that you would increase our faith by hearing and reading the Word of God. The faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Lord, help us to love our time alone with you. And God, we don't know why, but there's something that in you that, that you love spending time with us. And Lord, you want to be with us. You want to be with us personally and intimately and alone. And Jesus, you told us to go into our room and close the door and then to pray and then to seek your face. And our Father in heaven, who sees in secret will reward us and open. And so, Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name.